Okay, so the start, first of all, is you got to go find a team and, and to get into the team, you need to have a, a lot of experience. Um, I got very lucky and I got in with a team called Madison Imagineering, which is one of the most ex uh, experienced teams on the mountain, best one of the, with the best statistics. Um, and Gart Madison is the leader of that. He has been up Everest 10 times and all of the world's best climbers use his base camp to get into it. So Kenton Cool, who climbed Everest 15 times, uh, became a friend of mine last year and put me in touch with Garrett Madison and um, I did an interview with my CV, my climbing CV and to talk all around what I've done in the last 15, 20 years and, and you know, if, if they're happy with that then they'll, they'll offer you a place so they don't just let anyone into the team you've got to have experience to get to the team and, and luckily I got onto the team um, and from there then it's you got to go off and, and do your, your, your training and your practice and I went to South America beforehand and um, and met up with the, all of the guys in Kathmandu. Well, that's essentially how it works. It's, it's, it's a, like an interview process to get into a given team. Some of the other teams on the mountain, um, you know, they, they may cost less or they may have bigger groups in their team and they'll take on less experienced climbers. They're the teams usually where there's injuries or, or even people, you know, unfortunately uh, losing their lives on the mountain. So picking the right team, getting on the right team is essentially important. Um, there's a few parts of that. I'd say, look, the, being, it's, it's not just climbing the mountain, it's also about your mental strength, your, how physically strong you are, and resilience, being positive, keeping a strong mindset and frame of mind day after day. So I'd say there's constant pressure on you. So every single day you've got to be switched on. So whether you have to be switched on very much physically, but also some days you won't feel well, you, like you might have major headaches, some people have you know, bad stomach, some people have, or just haven't been able to eat. Um, there's all sorts of ailments people may have. Some people may have a little tweak to muscle or an injury or, or whatever. So there's these things where you just have to get over them quickly and move on with yourself. And you have to be switched on at all times. There's some, you're waiting around a lot of the time. The weather's not there, that's really tough. So you have to constantly remain switched on for any minute now that the weather might break and I'll tell you to get your gear on and up the mountain. So, for example, I camp three, I was lying on my back for 50 hours straight. I got up once in two days, but I was able to stand up once in, for five minutes. I went out of the tent on camp three on the side of the low tea face. We were hanging off the mountain and um, it was so wild. There was a cyclone in the area that I got blown back into the tent, had to lie back down again for 50 hours. No phone, nothing to look at, just lying there looking at the top of the tent. And then when we got to camp four, the weather was, we basically were running out of oxygen, so we had to go higher. And, the guys come in and say, look, the weather is crazy, but if you want a shot at the so much, well then, we got to go out into this. And then you click your fingers, lying on your back for 50 hours, and then boom, game on. You need to be switched on. And then we're heading up to low sea face with like 30, 40 kilos in a backpack and into a raging wind and snow and going up an ice face that's ex extremely steep and dangerous. That's what's hard. So just being resilient and tough every single day. Yeah, so we left the side call just uh, after midnight and, you know, it was, it was four hours of um, up steep rock and ice and it's it's obviously pitch black at that point, but the moon is lighting up the other peaks around Everest and you can see the stars. It's pretty amazing, but the weather was very wild when we left. It was hugely strong winds, so we just dug in. I was with my Sherpa, just the two of us climbing together and, um, you know, you do try and stop for a minute and take a breath and actually watch what you're doing rather than just looking at the back of his crampons but um at the same time that was a very dangerous part of the mountain because it was so windy and we were unclipping the whole time um and that means unclipping from the safety rope so we had to be careful you know nothing was going to go wrong or slip but we did try and take in points on the way up uh, so the first four hours you're heading towards a place called the balcony it's where you first change oxygen and we just got through the hard weather and, and i said we, you know look checked out the moon over the himalayas but at the balcony uh, this is a uh, soft upward sloping going towards um well it steepens up going towards the south summit um but that is a, a kind of a halfway point uh, on the final summit night on everest where you change oxygen and the after having wild weather for massively strong winds the, the weather just settled down completely for the first time in five or six days and, and the sun came up over the himalayas and we had unbelievable views. This is the best views I've ever seen in my life. The best sunrise I've ever seen in my life. And uh, just at that point, you're about 8,500 meters. So to, to see the whole world below you and uh, see a new day breaking is like a bit of a spiritual experience, to be honest. Uh, 
really incredible. Uh, and then you just keep on, that was about five o'clock in the morning. And then you keep on climbing up towards the south summit. And once you're there, you, you know, you're getting towards the top. Uh, and then we, when we eventually reached the top, you know, the, the views were just incredible. You could see the whole of uh, China uh, and, and Nepal um, below you. And you could almost see the curvature of the earth and, and, and the sky is like a dark, bluey black color. And it's just an incredible experience to see the whole world below you and you really know, feel how high you are. It's just incredible. Unbelievably important. So n nothing happens on high altitude mountains without Sherpas. So the Sherpas are, are a, a community of people in the high mountains of Nepal. Uh, they, they are the people that are born and bred in, in, in the Everest region in the National Park. So you know, they're they're small community of people, and you know their their bodies are, their body composition and, and lungs and everything about them are just made for, for mountaineering. You know, I'd said before the way you got Usain Bolt is made for running, and Michael Phelps is made for sprint, uh, sorry swimming. You know, these guys are born to climb. Um, you know, on any expedition, if they're not there, nothing happens. So how it works, you have everything from you know kitchen boys to support the. the the, the senior kitchen staff and the cooks. You have porters that carry gear from a place called Luklas where you fly into um, from Kathmandu into the mountains and then they carry gear from Lukla all the way up to base camp uh, along with yaks as well who carry a lot of the he heavier gear. Um, and all, some of them get helicoptered up. But you also, that's, and then as you go up, they kind of almost tearing as a way in terms of the, the, the importance of the Sherpa um, crew to, to any expedition. You then have the, the team that are around uh, base camp, they're up to 30 guys, and, and, and they are setting camps all the way up to camp four. Uh, so they all the tents, um, all the gear, all the equipment. We even had showers on base camp where the guys would carry water up to a high point of the hill. They fix all these lines down to these um, made up tents with methane gas and make it warm and, and on days when it wasn't snowing we could get a shower and, they, and all of that wouldn't happen without these guys um they clean the whole uh, you know base camp all the time they have to help just help everybody um that's the general sherpa crew and then as you go above them you got a the, the, the climbers and like the these sherpa climbers are are real superstars in, in nepal and in their villages you know many years ago the Sherpa community that were climbing with the old British expeditions or US expeditions in the past would have been, you know, almost subordinate to these um, explorers back in the day. Um, but now, you know, these guys are uh, pari passu with, um, you know, all of the elite climbers around the world. And, uh, you know, we all know they're better than we are. Um, and and they, they get acknowledged as true um, proper climbers, um, as they absolutely should, um, because they're incredible. Um, I can't say I saw many strange things, but you know, I did see um, some unfortunate fallen climbers. You know, there's when I got up to the south call, um, so as I on a previous answer there, so I left to camp three and it was very wild weather, and I climbed for 10 hours up to the south call, which was a very, very difficult day for me. Um, when we got up to the south call, that's at 8,000 meters, so you just come over to Geneva Spur and down into this kind of gully and that's at the base of the Everest cone. The winds up there were like 100 miles per hour and um, it's just a few ragged tents with a few rocks holding the tents down and when I dived into the tents there was um, unfortunately a, a fallen climber who, who'd uh, passed away two weeks before um, in the tent beside us so he was like half in half out of the tent and we were in a tent you know three or four feet away um, we were in that tent for 30 hours and knowing that this guy was next to us that his family had paid um, eight Sherpas to take him off the mountain. Um, so, you know, that, that's that's a reality of Everest. Um, two, two climbers uh, this year passed away up on top. Um, so he was one of them. So that was that's, that's something. And then, um, you know, there was obviously on the way up to uh, to the south summit and, and the Hillary step there's there's two more uh, people that you can come across so you know it's 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 a sensitive subject and one that you do with without respect but uh, you know uh, you know one of the guys passed away uh this year and then there was another guy there from 2019 that was still there and then one guy's at the south summit the other guy's um the Hillary step so you um you do literally encounter them uh, we knew about them before we went up so uh, we we were you know ready to uh, come across that, but it's 
it still re very much resonates with you um and it, it just really resonates what you're doing is got high risk to it and um and, but anyone that climbs Everest knows the risk before they leave, uh, leave their home country. Um, and, and you know, it's you can prepare as much as you can, and then it's, uh, it's you know in the hands of the gods beyond that. So that would really be the. Um, I would say something that was not startling because I was expecting to see it, but it's something that you know, it's something that still is uh, something you're not used to seeing, especially when you're on a mountain. So for me, there's there was two or three parts that I'd, I'd already meticulously looked at um, before I even went to Nepal, and I, I've known about it for years. The icefall being the number one uh, thing, and it, it's 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 in a very interesting and amazing place because it's something that you encounter on day one of climbing the mountain. So that the first day you go up into the mountain, uh, you go straight into the icefall. So you have to be switched on and on the ball instantly. It's not like any other mountain where you can ease your way into the mountain. This is this is like straight away, full focus. So we went through the ice wall six times, three up, three down. And at the at the beginning, you know, it's it's the glacier that moves all the time. It's huge, big ice seracs. You know, some of them sixty to hundred feet high. Um, we're climbing up them and we're abseiling down them. And you know, you're using what's called a jumar. Um, to to push and to pull yourself up the up these uh, big huge ice racks, um, and um, you know that's incredible. First of all, it's incredibly difficult climbing. It's very taxing, and you have a huge amount of weight on your back because you're carrying all the uh, weight up to camp two. On the first time we went through that, it took us nine hours. By the end of it, it took us four and a half hours. We got because we got so efficient and good at it and more confident in what we we're doing. But also over the course of the season, the um, ice fall changes massively because you're there for you know two months and also it's uh, nepal is moving from winter into spring at that point so uh, the crevasses start opening up more so the bigger the crevasses open up the deeper um, and wider they become so the metal ladders you use become more as you go along so at the start was only like six ladders by the end it was a lot of ladders and some of them would be two or three ladders lashed together and you'd have to walk across them um over a big you know 200 meter crevasse or whatever something along those lines so it's it can be scary um if you allow it to be and this is where your mindset comes in and your mental preparation and, and, and acceptance of that fear and, and harnessing that fear and that's i wasn't scared at all i i, I just i knew what i was going to be facing and i embraced it and i enjoyed it um, and i just said right and i didn't think about it when i got to those points at the, at the really deep crevasses and ladders you know in the past it would intimidate me but because i was so mentally ready for it I didn't even stop for a minute to look at it. I just saw it and powered across it and just went on to the next one. It was just so many of them, you can't be hanging around. And the ice wall is a place where you uh, you have to move quickly uh, because so many things can happen. You know, a, a couple of Sherpas were heavily uh, injured uh, carrying gear up to the ice wall at, at the beginning of the season from um, from ice seracs or, uh, and bridges falling on them. Uh, and so, you know, people can die in the ice wall. They usually do every year. This year, no one died in the ice fall, but uh, a Sherpa unfortunately fell into a, a crevasse on the way up between Cap 1 and Cap 2. So, and, and unfortunately passed away. So, you know, these are the realities of the dangers of the mountain. Um, then, as you go higher up the mountain, for me, um, so the ice fall, as I said, that's one of the main points. But as you go higher up, as you get up beyond Cap 3 to Cap 4, it's incredibly steep uh, ice, and that's on the low sea face. You know, if you slip there and you're in major, well, if you slip, you're gone, basically. And, and that's 10 hours going up, something like that. So that was very difficult. And then obviously, as you head up towards the summit, the final summit ridge between the south summit and the true summit, is just straight drops, thousands of meters either side. Uh, again, something that would intimidate me in the past, but this time around I was here, I'm just delighted to be here and just fully embrace it and focus, super focused. And then on the way down, um, you know, you have to be really dialed in coming on the way down to get past that ridge again, because you've already summited, you feel the elation of it all. And it's important to reset your focus and make sure you get down safely. And when I was coming down the mountain, um, I actually got frostbite, unfortunately. So it made, I got through my summit night, but I'm from heading down from the South Call at Camp 4 all the way to Camp 2. On the day after the summit, uh, I couldn't really use my hands. So it made the, down, the descending incredibly difficult and dangerous for me to go down the low sea phase, which is super steep. And I had to short rope with my, um, my, my colleague that was climbing with me, you know, it was a difficult climbing day for both of us. 
and it was extremely dangerous. And um, there was one slip I had on the ice, the Lotsi face, because my cramp on came half off and I was hanging onto the rope with one hand. I was hanging on to my cramp on the other hand and uh, if I'd lost my cramp on it would have been in major trouble because you, you don't bring spare cramp ons with you because it's more weight so you know these kind of little dangers that happen on the mountain but you just got to stay calm and cool and, and we sort it out. Well I've got lots of adventures um you know I, in, in terms of the mountains I'm definitely going to do what's called the Grand Slam so I'll, I'm going to finish off the seven summits um so the seven highest mountains in, around each continent in the world. Um, I'm going to Antarctica next uh, Christmas of December 22 to climb Vincent and go to the South Pole. Um, so I'm going to do that. And then I'll also go to the North Pole at some point. So the Grand Slam is the seven summits on the two poles. And uh, then I want to, my 8,000 meter career has only started really. I, I really want to do a lot more, you know, 14,000 eight meter mountains. You know, it's all about managing your life to fit with all of this. but. Um, I really want to do K2, which I know is the world's most dangerous mountain, um, but it's the ultimate test of mountaineering. I think it's, again, it's something I would have been a little bit intimidated of in the past, but because I've done Everest now, it gives you the confidence to know that you've got the technical skills and ability and the strength and mental strength to do it as well. You know, there's one or four people don't make it back down from K2, but, you know, the other three do, and it's, um, you got to live life on the edge if you're going to get most out of it. That's my view on things. So, um, that's why that's why I'd love to do that next, but it, we'll have to see.